Of the 53 women on death row, 14 are there for killing their children. One of these women is a young Texas woman from an affluent Dallas suburb named Darlie Routier. You know, there is nothing inside of her capable of doing this crime ever. She couldn't have snapped. You don't snap and then snap back. That's impossible. Did everyone miss the warning signs? What drove Darlie to kill her two young sons? Her story, next, on Women on Death Row. There are 14 women on death row for killing their children. The very idea goes against our cultural norms of motherhood and family. What turns a mother into a murderer? Women kill their children for a broader range of reasons than people might imagine. There's a group who do it when they're seriously mentally ill. And then there are women who kill their children for very evil reasons, getting the insurance money, getting revenge on the father of the child. Those crimes, when the public sees them, are the most alarming. In the upscale Dallas, Texas suburb of Rowlett, the Routier family was living the American dream. Husband Darren owned a thriving computer business. Darley, his wife, was a vivacious stay-at-home mom to three young children, Devin, Damon, and Drake. As a mother, she was just, you know, she just uh, taught me to be a better grandmother because, you know, she would take time to sit down and do crafts with the boys. And she took them to the movies, which was usually every Saturday her and Darren would take them. They were allowed to bring all their friends. Then one black night in June, the Routier's family was changed forever. June 6, 1996, about 2.30 in the morning, we received a call, screaming hysterical woman, uh, reporting that uh, her children had been stabbed and that she had been stabbed. Within minutes, the first patrol car arrived at the Routier home. There was a lot of confusion, chaos. The first responding officer was having difficulty communicating with Darley. She had some injuries. Her sons, Devin and Damon, were on the living room floor, drenched in pools of their own blood. It was quite obvious to the responding officers that uh, the children were either dead or almost one of them was in the process of expiring. It was a horrendous scene. They were, they had been stabbed multiple times. There was blood everywhere. As more patrol cars and ambulances arrived at the Routier home, a neighbor alerted Darley's mother. I was called by the nurse who lived across the street at 3 a.m. and she was crying that it something terrible had happened and I had to get there. And then immediately we got everybody together. It was like seeing the house in the movie, the great big house, only spotlights on it, 40 or 50 people outside, and all these cops and paramedics just running in and out of the front door, just total chaos all over the place. The ambulances rushed Darley and two of her sons to the hospital. Darley was barely hanging on to life. Her two young sons, however, were both dead. Darley was taken into surgery with a slashed throat and a severe knife wound on her arm. The surgeon talked to me and told me just how close she came to dying that was within one millimeter of her carotid artery. And he clearly told me the wound to her arm was a defense wound and that it went to the bone. Meanwhile, Rowlett police secured the scene. Darley had told police she saw the intruder go out the pantry door. Investigators searched the property looking for clues. They went through the, the garage and they went out through the laundry room, which is the area that Darley said the intruder left. They got into the garage and they couldn't see an obvious way to exit this garage. They, they saw the screen that was cut, um, but they continued their investigation. They went out into the backyard. They checked the fence briefly. There were no scuff marks. There were no footprints in the flower, flower beds. But when they went to open the gate, it, it stuck. It was very hard to open. 
and after forcing the gate open, they stepped into the driveway. At that time, a security light went on. If somebody had passed through there, that light would have been on before those officers set it off. Baffled by what was not at the scene, police questioned Darley as soon as she came out of surgery. Darley and her two older sons had been sleeping in the living room. She had been awakened by someone attacking her with a knife. <coughs> Darley fought for her life. Her assailant escaped through the kitchen door. Hold on, honey. Hold on. Hold on. Very early on in the case, conflicting information was coming out. Darley would tell one story that didn't match up with something that was seen in the physical evidence. Starting with the 911 call, she made a mention that there's a knife here, and the communications officer told her, don't touch it. And she made a very lucid, calm, rather unsettling statement back to the communications officer, well, I've already touched it, maybe you could have gotten prints off of it. That is not something that you would expect from a woman in Darley's situation. Faced with such a confusing story, Rowlett police called in a 40-year veteran crime scene investigator. Suddenly, the facts surrounding this tragic double murder changed dramatically. It's pretty obvious, about 30 minutes into the scene, that I felt like someone in the house committed the offense, not an intruder. Because evidence is sort of a silent witness. Evidence is there, and it's incumbent upon the investigators to find the evidence, analyze it, and put it to its correct use. Investigators began comparing the physical evidence to Darley's statements. I know they absolutely did not think it was Darley, and they thought it was Darren because he was kept away from us, and he was not injured. He had awakened to Darley's screams and rushed downstairs to discover the gruesome scene. They found his story matched the evidence they had so far. Darley had told me that she was laying on the uh, sofa uh, and that at this time that she was fighting with this uh, stranger and that the stranger had cut her throat. Well, if he's cutting her throat while she's laying on the sofa, then this blood is gonna run this direction across her uh, chest. Uh, but the way we found that blood on her T-shirt, all of it ran down, which means she had to be standing up. As the investigation continued, police became convinced Darley had murdered her sons and staged her own injuries. I found her to be a liar. Uh, every time, you know, she'd tell me a story, the story was different. She said that she, the reason why she was sleeping downstairs was because the youngest child, who was an infant, was asleep in the baby bed upstairs. She said she'd wake up if that baby would roll over, but yet she didn't wake up while her two children were being stabbed. Adding more suspicion to Darley's tale, the blood evidence at the scene did not match Darley's version of events. We also found her barefooted footprints under the kitchen sink, which she also told me is that she had never went to the kitchen sink. She always went to the right side of that kitchen island. A thorough investigation of the kitchen revealed that the knife used in the attack came from the Routier's kitchen. Using the chemical luminol, evidence revealed that someone had used the sink to wash off blood. Would an intruder wash up before he went rushing out the back door? Or would someone trying to hide the evidence resort to a rushed cleanup detail? The physical evidence is talking to us and it's telling us that Darley killed her children. That's the worst case scenario that we were faced with. But you've got to go where the evidence leads you. The evidence was clear to the Rowlett investigating team. Ten days after the brutal death of her two young sons, Darley Routier was arrested as the killer of her two kids. There is nothing inside of her capable of doing this crime, ever. She couldn't have snapped. You don't snap and then snap back. That's impossible. It doesn't happen that people just snap and do something out of character, but it does happen that people who were good can change and do evil things. This crime uh, was committed by Darley Routier. Uh, all the physical evidence tells us that she did it. The jury gave her death sentence for it. Although she continues to sit on death row in Texas, Darley Routier and her family hope that she's proven innocent. But regardless, they don't believe she'll be put to death. 
they made a mistake and they won't owe up to it in Texas. Darley and her family may be correct. According to Victor L. Stribe, professor of law at Ohio Northern University, current statistics show that of the women sentenced to death row, only 10% of them are actually executed. When I hear someone saying that they were innocent, I take that very seriously because I don't hear it very often. Will new evidence convince the courts that she is not the cold-blooded murderer the police claim? Unless someone steps in and writes this terrible wrong, Darnie is gonna die. Darlie Routier is one of 53 women sitting on death row. She was convicted of the brutal murders of her two young sons. Darlie claims an intruder broke into her home and stabbed her sleeping sons to death. She also contends that the injuries she sustained are the result of a struggle with the real murderer. The Rowlett Police Department said the evidence proved otherwise. We proved beyond a reasonable doubt with the prosecuting attorneys, the district attorney's office. We presented this case in front of a, a jury. The jury listened closely to that information and they rendered a verdict. While convicted of killing her children, her family contends she's innocent and believes the investigation was botched from the beginning by the Rowlett Police Department. Somebody broke into the house. Somebody killed her kids, and then the police couldn't get enough evidence to point to someone else, so they turned it all towards Darley. When they put the target on you, it doesn't matter if proof comes in that you're innocent. They stay and focus on what they know was right from day one. Outraged by the horrific crime, author Barbara Davis attended the trial as research for her book about the case, Precious Angels, which claimed that without a doubt, Darley Routier was guilty of savagely murdering her two young sons. I believe Darley was guilty because I stayed at the trial for five weeks and attended every day and watched the evidence that was presented to the jury. And they convinced me beyond any doubt that she had done this crime. Days after the publication of her book, Davis was given a copy of the crime scene photographs. To Ms. Davis' shock and surprise, not all the photos were shown to the jury. Well, there were pictures that were published to the jury and pictures that were not. And there were two, maybe 300 photographs in which they were all entered into evidence. But there were maybe six or seven that were posted on board in the courtroom where everyone could see them. In a moment that remains one of the most dramatic of her life, Ms. Davis realized that these photographs put a whole other spin on the Routier case. I had moments of Eureka when I saw evidence after evidence that had not been presented in the trial. After carefully studying the police photographs taken of the scene, she now believes there were life-changing mistakes made in the investigation, beginning with Darley's wounds from the attack. These two photographs are really important. They're the ones that indicate to me somebody was holding her down. This one again is of the arm, and these are the backs of her hands, which indicate they are defensive in, in nature. These photographs were never shown to the jury. Darley's appeal lawyer, Stephen Cooper, also believes the police bungled the case and ignored standard crime scene procedure. There's videotape showing uh, the collection of evidence where they're stuffing bloody clothing all in the same bag where there's cross-contamination. I mean, it's a horrible idea. All the evidence at the scene showed that Darley Rotier killed her two sons. There was no contradictory evidence. There was no signs of any supposed intruder. This is a massive crime scene with blood uh, all over the place, fingerprints and blood and none of this evidence had been analyzed, evaluated. Davis and Cooper are quick to point out there are many pieces of evidence that support Darley's version of events. They believe evidence exists that proves Darley Routier did not kill her children. They're fingerprints, uh, but they're fingerprints in blood, which means someone who was there in that home that night made that fingerprint. They don't match the boys, they don't match Darley or Darren, 
and they don't match any of the medical personnel or law enforcement personnel that was there. It means they match whoever was in that house that escaped. Other evidence that points to an intruder are a cut screen in the garage and a sock with Devin's blood found in an alley three houses away. Number two, the screen was cut the whole length of the screen in a T, and we heard all these things in the paper saying that it appeared to be cut from the inside, but when we got to the trial, a whole different story, because under oath they had to admit it was cut from the outside. And here's the sock that was found with uh, both boys' blood, a spot of it, and Darlie's DNA. It's three yards down in the backyard. What sense would it make for my daughter to take a sock 75 yards down the alley? Directly across from where that sock was found was a butcher knife, very close size and shape to the one that was used to injure Darlie and to kill Damon. And it was buried in the ground up to the handle. The police saw this the night they were investigating and they made the decision that it wasn't a piece of evidence, it was simply a digging tool and he didn't disturb it, didn't take it in for test. And when the trial was gonna start about six or seven months later, the DA's office sent him back to retrieve it. Darley Routier's supporters continue to pose one simple question. If the jury had heard about all the evidence police investigators dismissed, would they have had reasonable doubt and acquitted Darley Routier? Darley's totally innocent of this. They've never shown any motive. Appeals for a new trial drag on as Darley sits on death row, waiting for her death warrant to be signed. On the advice of her attorney, Darley will no longer speak about her case outside of the courtroom. While they continue to hope for the best, her supporters and family live with the fact Darley may never be freed. It's taken over my life. It's, uh, you wake up in the morning thinking about it because what they've done is they've taken a young mother who was a victim and put her in there and taken her life away from her and her children's life and her family's life. The life of a woman on death row in Texas means isolation from the general prison population. She is not allowed to go out of her cell, except for an hour a day. Darley suggested it as well as any individual possibly could. She had her two boys taken from her, and then they turn around and they take her other son from her. The night of the murders, Darley's youngest son, Drake, was sleeping safely upstairs. They're victimizing Drake, who's now nine years old and only sees his mother through glass. Living on death row means Darley cannot hug or touch her family. State of Texas doesn't allow any contact visits for death row inmates. She can put her hand against his hand through the glass, and that's as close as they've been since he was eight months old. It's difficult to think about all the things that have changed since Darley's been in prison. She's missed out on, you know, Drake's first day of school. She missed um, all the Easter egg hunts, all his Halloween costumes, all these things she's missed because they made a mistake and they won't owe up to it in Texas. She said that if she dies, that she will be with her boys so she'll be okay. But she's fighting because that's not what the truth is and that's not what Devin and Damon would want her to do. They would want her to fight for the truth. I don't know who did it, but I know Darlie didn't. Unless someone steps in and writes this terrible wrong, Darlie is gonna die. She's not gonna be executed. She's gonna be murdered for something she didn't do. And she's sitting there today on death row waiting for justice to catch up with her. We know that we're speaking for two dead little boys and we're the last voice that they have. They have lost every legal challenge that they have put forth. We proved beyond a reasonable doubt Darlie Routier killed those children. And she was exactly where she needs to be right now on death row. Look at the bare hard facts. You know, it, you can see, there's so much that you can see that I didn't do this. When I hear someone saying that they were innocent, I take that very seriously because I don't hear it very often. What you hear a little bit more often is that the circumstances are not what they're made out to be, and often that is true. Death Row brings one day like the last until the frightening day when they learn their date of execution. 
death penalty cases cost as much as four times more than non-capital trials. How resources are spent in the administration of justice is part of the ongoing debate on the death penalty. The automatic appeals process can cost millions in legal fees. Between 1973 and 1998, the state of Florida spent $57 million on just 18 executions. The death penalty is enormously costly to administer. As long as the sets of rights and the appellate opportunities remain as they are today, it would be more cost effective to keep more people incarcerated rather than bother trying to execute the few who absorb so many of the resources with their appeal process. But the biggest price we pay may be the execution of innocent people wrongly convicted. I certainly wouldn't want to have an innocent person executed. I wouldn't want someone who did not get a fair trial uh, to be executed. That is exactly the situation Darley and her family feel they are in. It's an awful, awful reality. But the truth is, is God has always provided for us and, and God has always given us what we've asked for. And it may take 10 or 12 years and, you know, it might really not happen. But as far as I'm concerned, I have complete faith in God, not the justice system. Convicted of the brutal stabbing death of her two young sons, Darley's family fights within the justice system for a new trial to clear her name and set her free. She does not deserve to be in there. I believe that those prosecutors and police officers that lied deserve to be in there. They're the ones who have become the criminals that they have prosecuted. They've been around them. They've learned from the best. This woman was railroaded by a system that she believed in. Um, she handed her keys over to him and said, go to it, find my baby's killers, I believe in you, and was hit blindsided because of that faith. Darley believed in police. She cooperated with police. She thought that they would actually find the killers. Her whole family did. They cooperated with, with the police. She thought the justice system would work. You know, hire a good lawyer, go to trial, and she would be vindicated. Uh, then she thought the appeals process would work and she would get a fair shake. As Darley sits on death row, her mother is devoted to keeping her daughter alive and to finally get her freed. Oh, it's just uh, taken over my whole personality. It's taken over my life. I'm not gonna stop. You know, if they kill Darley, I feel like they'll kill me. I have my faith that God didn't save her that night within one millimeter for to be killed at the hands of the state of Texas. She has a right to be uh, outraged about this. Her daughter's been put in prison for something she didn't do. Her daughter will die for something she didn't do. If somebody doesn't do something to stop this huge cog of justice gone awry. We're just waiting and waiting and waiting. But I think the only thing that keeps me going personally is the fact that I know she'll come out and I know that it'll all be, you know, taken care of and things will be back to somewhat normal again. But for now, this is normal. So. As a woman living on death row, what kind of life could possibly be worth living? For Darlie Routier, it's a life of hope based on the belief that she will one day receive a trial that finally sets her free.